He studied a very wide range of subjects, um, from a history of art, German literature, musicology, and philosophy at the universities, both of Heidelberg and Paris, um, gaining a PhD in Heidelberg in 1996. He's at present um, professor of early modern and modern art history at Heidelberg University. Um, research and publications, which are manifold, focus on French and Italian painting of the 16th and 17th century, uh, focusing on Poussin, um, as well as on the reform in painting by the Caracci. And there is a whole body of publications as well on contemporary architecture and its relation to modern media. Thank you. We'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> And okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I want, first want to thank Jean-Michel Massin and Pierre Rosenberg for uh, l'invitation, and I'm now switching to English. Um, <laughs> Pierre Rosenberg has yesterday talked about why is Poussin so beloved in England, and I want to try a little bit different approach. Why was he hated by certain people in England? And I um, want to show that perhaps this hate wasn't even uh, justified. It is known and clear that Hogarth apparently wasn't very fond of Poussin, or at least he wanted to give the impression that he wasn't. In his analysis of beauty from 1753, he writes that, and I quote, Poussin's scars ever obtained a glimpse of the art of coloring beauty, end quote, and Hogarth adds, as is manifest by his many different attempts. Indeed, France has not produced one remarkable good colorist, end quote. <laughs> Early in the book, Hogarth had already played out Rubens, who at least in the area of fresco painting had found his mercy. I quote, his manner was admirably well calculated for great works to be seen at a considerable distance, although sometimes too much for easel or cabinet pictures, end quote. So early in the book, Hogarth had already played out Rubens against Poussin and vice versa. I quote again, Rubens would in all probability have been as much disgusted at the dry manner of Poussin as Poussin was at the extravagant of Rubens, end quote, a claim voiced in order to show that the prejudice of inferior proficient in favor of the imperfection of their own performances is still more amazing. But when considering paintings such as Hogarth Moses brought to Pharaoh's daughter from 1746, which clearly picks up Poussin's Moses trampling on Pharaoh's crown, painted almost exactly 100 years earlier in 1645-48, and showing events after the episode depicted by Hogarth, it becomes evident that Hogarth seems to have respected the dry and inferior proficient Poussin at least in some way, since he otherwise would have chosen another model on which to base his proof that he, Hogarth, was also capable of history painting. The composition and the direction in which the action unfolds are very similar, and in the other version of the painting or subject, Poussin even situates the action also in the exterior instead of a closed throne room, just like Hogarth 100 years later did also. It actually rather looks as if Hogarth would not have tried to steer away from Poussin's model, but instead would have aimed to achieve what already the German painter and historiographer Joachim von Sandrath postulated in theory as a solution to Germany's artistic crisis in the 17th century, and what he therefore tried to accomplish and practice with his own paintings, to combine Poussin's studious compositions with Rubens, as Hogarth claimed it, bloom tints. Now, essays to reconcile Hogarth and Poussin have been made previously. In his 1971 book, Hogarth, His Life, Art and Times, Ronald Paulson had compared and approached both painters by referring to the point that, I quote, both saw the solution to the recurrent problem of how to breathe new life into history painting because they found the history painting of their day given over to decorative, operatic, meaningless conventions. However, Paulson was severely attacked and chastised for his attempt, especially by Francis H. Dowley in a review published in the Journal of Modern History from December 1973. After having summed up Paulson's view, as just quoted here, Dowley comments, I quote, with phrases like the last, Paulson reveals his misunderstanding of the Baroque. Did Roman history painting need revitalizing by Poussin with Domenichino still painting? 
are Pietro da Cortona's allegory so meaningless, end quote, Dowley then refers to Horace Walpole, who, in Dowley's view, understood Hogarth better than Paulson, or Henry Fielding, on whose definition of Hogarth's progresses, the Rake's progress, the Harlot progress, as comic history paintings, Paulson had relied. Dowley writes, I quote, Horace Walpole perhaps understood Hogarth's aims better when he designated him more uh, as a writer of comedy with a pencil than as a painter. Paintings of history would be closer, of course, to tragedies than to comedies. Likewise, Walpole's comparison of Hogarth with Moliere seems more apt than Paulson's comparison of him with Poussin. As Moliere sounds many a serious note in his comedies without having to turn them into tragedies, so Hogarth could also be serious in his progresses without having to turn them into paintings of history." End quote. Once is hence warned not to try to approach or associate Poussin and Hogarth too fast and easy. However, that Hogarth, being a pragmatic and astute businessman, at least had no problems to sell engravings after Poussin's paintings, becomes clear from an account book leaf from the 5th February to the 4th April 1752, that is a year before the publication of the Analysis of Beauty, attributed because of the handwriting, the offered prints, and the wording to Hogarth, and bought in 2005 by the Paul Mellon Fund. There, among other items, such as Hogarth's March to Finlay, also eight prints after Nicolas Poussin are listed as having been sold. There seems to be, however, more. In 1811, in an article titled On the Genius and Character of Hogarth, with some remarks on a passage in the writings of the late Mr. Barry, and this late Mr. Barry is James Barry, a professor of painting from the Royal Academy, the author, English poet and essayist Charles Lamb, deplores the fact that it, I quote, is the fashion with those who cry up the great historical school in this country, at the head of which is Sir Joshua Reynolds, is placed, to exclude Hogarth from that school as an artist of an inferior and vulgar class." End quote. In order to show that such a judgment is wrong, Lamb compares Poussin's plague at Ashdod and Hogarth's gin, line, gin lane. He does so without giving a precise reason for this comparison, which he also doesn't really take any further, apart from both scenes showing a city whose inhabitants are threatened by an affliction and a scourge. We'll, we'll later see why he doesn't detect any further parallels between the two compositions. However, the juxtaposition makes perfect sense. In Poussin's case, it is the plague which is responsible for babies being neglected by their mothers, and the painter stresses the beginning of the cities and the community's ruin by showing that the architecture of the city, in this particular case, the temple of the idol Dagon, but also the building in the background, um, so you can see here, uh, crippled architecture and also in the background you can see that for example this obelisk uh, is partly ruined already. Uh, in Hogarth's composition the gin consumption of the city's population is the reason why mothers abandon their babies, the neglect of the city's buildings and their ensuing crumbling and foundering. Lamb sees especially in Hogarth's composition a fruitful imagination at work. I quote, that power which draws all things to one which makes things animate and inanimate, beings with their attributes, subjects, and their accessories take one color and serve to one effect. Everything in the print, to use a vulgar expression, tells. Every part is full of strange images of death. And with this quote from Shakespeare's Macbeth, we also recognize in Lamb, the author of the famous children book, Tales from Shakespeare, which was published in 1807. I continue with a quote. It is perfectly amazing and astounding to look at. Not only the two prominent figures, the woman and the half-dead man, which are ter as terrible as anything as Michelangelo ever drew, but everything else in the print contributes to be wilder and stupefy. The very houses, as I heard a friend of mine express it, tumbling all over in various directions seem drunk, seem absolutely reeling from the effect of the diabolical spirit of frenzy which goes forth over the whole composition. Once made aware of this element, one can also detect it in Poussin's painting, uh, where you also have uh, buildings which are slightly tilted, which hint upon the fact that Hogarth here was most likely inspired by Poussin. I continue with a quote from Lamb, 
To show the poetical and almost prophetical conception in the artist, one little circumstance may serve. Not content with the dying and dead figures, which he has strewed in profusion over the proper scene of the action, he shows you what, of a kindred nature, is passing beyond it. Close by the shell in which, by direction of the parish beadle, a man is depositing his wife, is an old wall which, partaking of the universal decay around it, is tumbling to pieces. Through a gap in this wall are seen three figures which appear to make a part in some funeral procession which is passing by the other side of the wall out of the sphere of the composition. This is um, here. This extending of the interest beyond the bounds of the subject could only have been conceived by a great genius." End quote. It is because of these qualities in Hogarth's engraving that Lamb ultimately also agrees with the reader, he says we all agree, uh, that the palm of superior genius should be conferred upon Hogarth and not on Poussin, from whom, however, as we have seen, Hogarth most likely did get some inspiration for this poetical and almost prophetical conception in the first place. However, unjustly, the broader audience, according to Lamb, didn't, and probably still doesn't, think in his terms, because they, as I quote, confound the painting of subjects in commune or vulgar life with the being a vulgar artist. And since in Gin Lane there is plenty of poverty and low stuff to disgust upon a superficial view, a cold spectator would accordingly feel himself immediately disgusted and repelled. I have seen many turn away from it, not being able to bear it. The same persons would perhaps have looked with great com complacency upon Poussin's celebrated picture of the plague of Athens. And yes, he says, the plague of Athens, which means Lamb actually does label the painting in such a way, which is interesting inasmuch as Poussin's painting actually gave the inspiration for depictions of the plague of Athens, such as, for example, the work by the Flemish painter Michael Sweerts, likewise inspired by Poussin's canvas. In a footnote, Lamb mentions a certain late Mr. Hope in Cavendish Square as the owner of the painting he talks about. Hence, he didn't see Poussin's original, which was in France at the time, but he obviously saw the Swerds painting, which was then attributed to Poussin, only Longhi in 1933 attributed it to Swerds, and which belonged in 1811 to Henry Hope, the Boston-born Amsterdam merchant banker, who together with his collection of 372 paintings, among them works by Franz Hals, Paul Peter Rubens, Rembrandt, and Sir Anthony van Dyck, had fled to London in, 19, 19, in 1794, where he lived together with other members of his family, such as his younger cousin Thomas, likewise a merchant banker, but also an author, philosopher, and art collector, in a residence in London in Duchess Street, Cavendish Square. Thomas, in 1824, as Pierre Rosenberg mentioned yesterday, actually owned a real Poussin, with the inspiration of the poet today at the Louvre. Since Henry Hope died in 1811, it becomes understandable why Lamb, in his 1811 text, calls him the late Mr. Hope. So Lamb did look at the wrong painting, which was not by Poussin, but he did get the right ideas when comparing Poussin and Hogarth. He continues, I quote, disease and death and bewildering terror in Athenian gar garments are endurable and come, as the delicate critics express it, with the limits of pleasurable sensation. But the scenes of their own St. Giles, delineated by their own countrymen, are too shocking to think of." End quote. What people with such a judgment overlook in Lamb's view is the fact that even though the subject and the represented stuff might be low and vulgar, this is balanced not only by the composition's moral aim and predication, but also by the way in which it has been crafted by the artist. Another quote, the quantity of thought which Hogarth crowds into every picture would alone unvulgarize every subject which he might choose, end quote. This is an interesting statement in so far as one can see here a certain parallel to the aesthetic thinking of Poussin. Although this might appear as surprising at first sight, 
since Poussin mostly shied away from depicting topics which could be labeled as vulgar or even mundane or, and everyday, even in the area of drawings, we only have a few sheets where sub such subjects are shown. But Lamb's conception is not restricted to the motives as such, but concerns rather the basic question how a topic associated with certain judgments, such as vulgar, mundane, and common, might be turned into their exact opposites. That there are further connections between Hogarth and Pusa can also be seen when we look at Hogarth's analysis of beauty, to which the engraving after his Moses brought to Pharaoh's daughter, executed in 1752, six years after the painting was finished, should point with its included line of beauty, which you can see here, this is uh, the line of beauty, the snake. The analysis was published in the following year, and its author here rejoices in the preface that he previously had included the line of beauty into his <coughs> artworks in order to lay out a bait, and he then contently states, I quote, no Egyptian hieroglyphic ever amused more than it did for a time. Painters and sculptors came to me to know the meaning of it, being as much puzzled with it as other people, till it came to have some explanation, end quote. And if you look at the engraving after the painting, it actually looks even more Poussinesque than the original painting itself. It is now interesting to observe that one can detect in the analysis further parallels with Poussin concerning the taste and the models of the two painters. First, Hogarth, in his illustrating plate one of the analysis, depicts the classical sculpture for the, of the Antinos, standing in the courtyard, which was modeled upon the one Hogarth friend Henry Chia had established since 1726 at Hyde Park Corner. The, Antun the Antinous, with his elegant fluid pose, which is based on the serpentine line of beauty, here works at a contrasting and correcting figure to the stiffly dressed and thus also awkwardly gesturing gentleman dancing master. However, it is especially this sculpture which was also said to have been measured and analyzed by Poussin in order to stand and understand the mathematical principle behind the ideal and harmonious proportions of such classical artworks. And Poussin's biographer, Giovan Pietro Bellori, thus indirectly emphasizing the importance of this particular sculpture for the French painter, passes along Poussin's results via numbers and images in his annex to Poussin's biography, published in 1672. Then, secondly, if we look at a plate two of the analysis, we find another figure which both Poussin and Hogarth highly appreciated. In order to show to which, to which extent a pose can be elegant and beautiful when applying the line of beauty, Hogarth picks the figure of the woman of Samaria, as I, I quote from Hogarth, from one of the best pictures Anibal Karash ever painted, end quote, as he states in the analysis. It is, however, exactly this figure that Poussin also chose as a model for one of the protagonists in the plague of Ashdod, the man on the left, where he just mirrored the poise and changed the sex from female to male. But these are not just simple coincidences, for if we now look at the ideas behind Hogarth's choices, we see that they're also parallel with Poussin's central conceptions. <coughs> In his analysis, Hogarth demonstrated with theoretical implications could be seen in and behind even the seemingly simple depictions of everyday <coughs> scenes and Lamb is thus right when he stresses the fact that the quantity of thought which Hogarth crowds into every picture would alone unvulgarize every subject which he might choose. Poussin here certainly would have agreed, for in his observations on painting, also conveyed by Bellori to us, we find a maxim based on the concept of Toccato Tasso, which says, La novità nella pittura non consiste principalmente nel soggetto non più veduto, ma nella buona e nuova disposizione ed espressione, e così il soggetto dal essere comune e vecchio diviene singolare e nuovo. Novelty in painting does not primarily consist of never before unseen topics, but of the good in new disposition and expression, and so the topic from being common and old gets singular and new. Hogarth's quantity of thought and Poussin's good and new disposition 
can be thus seen in the same light, and it becomes clear that there is a lot of that parallels and actually unites the two painters. The reason why Hogarth, however, almost ostentatiously distanced himself from Poussin by criticizing him has certainly to be seen in the fact that Poussin was also part of the canon artists such as Sir Joshua Reynolds, Hogarth's adversary, advocated. And the same holds true for James Barry, on which remarks on Hogarth, um, Lamp uh, draws certain ideas and which he criticizes because he says also Barry is exactly in the same vein. He also criticizes Hogarth for being vulgar. Beyond such politics, however, one should instead see Hogarth as an artist who at least equaled the aesthetic quality and meticulousness of somebody like Poussin, who claimed for himself the notion, je n'ai rien négligé, I didn't neglect a thing, something Hogarth likewise would have said for himself. But in order to see such an equality, one should not further play off the one against the other, but should instead rather begin to see their parallels and connections, which, as I hope could be shown, might lead to the one or the other reciprocal illuminating insight into their work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Monsieur Rosenberg. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, the opposition, of course, to, of Hogarth to Poussin. Is, um, has to be explained in the great battle between Rubenism and Poussinism. And in France itself, uh, the Duke of Richelieu, the great collector of Poussin, when he sold his pictures, went to Rubens and built the greatest collection of Rubens I think ever made, more or less. I mean, so in, a way, in, in France, in a certain way, uh, the Rubenist won the battle against the Poussinist and had, uh, were running the artistic life in France uh, for half a century, uh, for the end of the 17th century until, uh, I mean, Watteau clearly is a Rubenist, and all this uh, tradition proves that uh, Poussin, in spite of his glory, was uh, in a way less beloved in France than Rubens. And uh, this uh, courant and this movement of Rubenism, of course, Hogarth is part of it and uh, was a very powerful one. So, in a way, uh, yeah, it's amusing to see Hogarth taking this position, but you, one could find in France examples of many artists not officially saying this, but clearly uh, prefer choosing Rubens against Poussin uh, in a very clear way. I mean, a uh, book about this by Alexis Merle Dubourg about mm -hmm. Rubenism in France, who proves that in some way the glory of Rubens was far greater than the one of Poussin mm -hmm. for a long time. That's, but I mean, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm only adding this, but it has not great importance for the Reynolds uh, question. But it's, it's